Hi, I'm Arun George and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In today's episode we're discussing the biggest problem Gujarat is facing as COVID-19 cases rise in districts of the state. We're also taking a look at a CBI court declaring that it will announce its verdict in the Babri Masjid demolition case. But first, we're discussing a ban on the export of onions and whether it actually benefits anyone. You probably know this, but India consumes a lot of onion. Parthasathi Biswas, who reports on agriculture for the Indian Express, tells us just how much. On an average, we produce around 220 lakh tons of onion a year. Then uh, the demand for onion in the country is around 160 lakh tons. The food processing units normally consume 10 lakh tons and 2 lakh tons of onion is used for seed production. Around 25 lakh tons of onion is exported annually. One ton incidentally is a thousand kilos. So let's just go over those numbers again. India produces 220 lakh tons of onions annually, consumes 170 lakh tons and exports 25 lakh tons. Basically, around 11% of all onions grown in India are exported. Partha says there are three onion seasons which are based on when onion is sown and when it is harvested by farmers. A kharif crop is sown between June and July and harvested after October. The late kharif crop is sown in September and harvested in January. And the most important crop, the rabi crop, is sown in January and harvested after March. Rabi is the only crop which is amenable to storage because it has less moisture content. And uh, this coincides with the summer or the winter months. So soil moisture is also not that high. So this onion can be stored. What farmers in Maharashtra and other onion growing states of the country do is that they store this onion in raised structures called kanda chawl and and they offload it in the off season. If you see the onion calendar between March till October, this uh, few months, there are no new crop happening. So this is the stored onion which is offloaded and feeds the market around the year. What happens is that before Maharashtra's Kharif crop comes to the market in September, Karnataka, which is the second largest producer of onion in the country after Maharashtra, its Kharif crop gets ready. Farmers in Karnataka take the Kharif crop a bit early. They take it somewhere, they start start sowing it somewhere in April, May and start harvesting in September. So the onion calendar is a very tricky calendar. If there is a mismatch or if there is some calamity that happens in any of the states or if there is a delay in the rainfall or excess rainfall, it goes for a toss. And that's what happened this year. The monsoon came on time, but there were heavy rains in August, which damaged the crop in Karnataka that would have normally reached markets in September. The reports that came from North Karnataka talked of almost 100% damage to the onion crop there. And because there was no onion crop which would come into the markets in September, onion prices started rising. The crop in Karnataka that should have come in September was damaged by the rains. Meanwhile, the heavy rains also damaged the onion crop in states like Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat. That's why there is a supply-demand mismatch at this moment. And as of now, the only onions which are coming into the market are the rabi onions stored by the farmers of Maharashtra after harvesting in March this year. So because of this supply-demand mismatch, we do see a price rise in the wholesale markets. Martha says that such shortages are hardly uncommon given the importance of the monsoon in the onion crop. It's a gamble. If you remember last year, uh, the same situation happened. But that time, that was because of a drought. Because there was almost drought-like situation in June, July. The rains were almost absent. Farmers in Maharashtra could not take their crops. So the prices had started rising. The prices of onion had begun rising in August itself. They breached the 30 rupee a kilo mark soon enough. When the prices touched 40 rupees a kilo, the government reacted by banning the export of all onions. But here's the thing. Export quality onions aren't the kind of onions you usually buy in the market. Partha says that these are the most premium onions with low moisture content that are bought by traders specifically to weather the journey to other countries and survive there as well. Let's now put that in price terms. Partha says that if one quintal of regular onion goes at an average price of 2400 rupees per quintal, the export quality onions would be priced at 2700 rupees per quintal. Also, if you're wondering how much is at stake, the value of onions exported last year was 323 million US dollars. So who is the biggest loser with this export ban? Obviously, the biggest loser of this will be the farmers and to an extent exporters. But we need to understand the exporter is a businessman. He has his or her uh, funds hedged some way or the other. 
the farmer does not the only thing he has is his onions which he harvested in uh, april or may or march and is still in this instance storing it in structures he has a inventory cost he has beef storage losses he has see here he has to get back the investment of onions that he had got last year in uh, september onwards onion prices were high so they may have made some money however since january there has been a drastic decrease in prices so they have lost that money they have made we need to remember last year when the farmers produced onion there was a lot of moisture stress the excess moisture stress and prior to that there was moisture stress because of drought so their cost of investment has gone up and whether they have recovered that cost of investment in the uh, transactions they did in september october is to be calculated no one does this calculations at the farm end The ban on export of onions also means that traders will buy less of the crop since there's no money to be made on exports. So after the ban on exports, there was an instant drop in the price of onion. But don't cheer just yet. This is going to be the trend for the next six or seven days. Pantha says that measures like an export ban are not going to help curb the price of the staple since the cause for the price rise is a more fundamental one: a mismatch in supply and demand. because there is hardly any onion and a crop it, it is not like something which you can produce in a factory line in a second or one or two days the onion crop takes at least 3 or 4 months to reach the market you cannot expect a miracle and the onion crops will come uh, i mean it's not like something which will drop down from heaven even if they have put an export ban even if they have ensured that onion does not leave the indian markets or whatever the new crop is not going to arrive before november come what may even if you want to import from the outside markets to float the tenders to get the approvals and everything it will take a month or two so after the initial shock the prices are going to rise because there is a fundamental supply demand mismatch so prices are going to rise later this month also and still the time the november onion comes into the market things are going to be unstable pantha says that even if onions are imported to bring down prices by the time they arrive indian farmers will be harvesting the november crop so this export ban is not going to help the indian consumer in the long run prices are going to rise and onion is going to be on fire payas rulaega as the markets in lasalgaon say they so the ban is just a very short time maybe 7 to 10 days prices will be under control and again when the demand goes up in the domestic market when the supply dips then prices will again rise when the export ban was imposed there were around 7000 tons of onions at the mumbai port waiting to be exported to multiple nations Martha says that onions from Mumbai go to the Middle Eastern nations, Malaysia and Sri Lanka. There were another 300 trucks filled with onions headed to Bangladesh, the biggest importer of India's onions. Indian onion has made its mark in the international market because of its pungency and because of the almost surety of the product on the produce that our farmers and our traders have maintained. Normally such consignments take about 3 days to be cleared before they can be sent across borders. by the time the ban came in most of the traders and exporters were in the middle of sending out consignments tying up the loose ends they had no clue there were obviously talks that there might be some action because prices are rising but no one expected a overnight ban the issuing of a ban wasn't a surprise given it had happened last year as well as partha said earlier the crop was hit last year by a drought and an export ban was imposed in september the same time as this year but though a ban was imposed last year as well Partha explains why this year's ban is unusual. Normally, the things go like this. In case the prices are too high for comfort for the government, uh, the government first comes up with what is called a minimum export price (MEP). Minimum export price is a price below which exports are not allowed to happen. That is the first indication that the government is not comfortable with the rise of price in onion. So the MEP had come somewhere in June, July, if I am not wrong. And when the onion prices refused to cool down, they came up with a complete ban on onion export. This year there was no MEP. The direct brambhas, as many of the traders call it in the arsenal of the government, is the export ban. So immediately they came up with the export ban on Monday. Basically, when the government imposes a minimum export price, traders know that a ban is imminent. But in this case, there was no warning at all. So, what happens to these onions that are stuck in transit? Partha says that what's stuck at ports is stuck, and what's on the way to cross a border can't be called back. Trade sources say that around twenty to twenty-five thousand tons of onion are at the ports at this moment, either in Mumbai port or at the land port in Bangladesh, which is supposed to be trucked into Bangladesh in a day or two's time. And some of the consignments might be midway on the road, and there is no way you can call them back. 
So instead, what they are going to do is they are going to divert these onions to nearby market. So in case of Mumbai, they might send it to the Washi market. In case of Bangladesh border, they will send it to either Uttar Pradesh or Kolkata. or to the northeast of the countries and the immediate result of this will be a sliding down of onion prices in those states and also in maharashtra because the export quality will also be coming back to the indian markets and then the next 4 or 5 days we might see onion prices cooling down a bit for traders and for exporters this would mean selling their onions at a lower price but they cannot let this onion rot at the port or at the bangladesh border so they will divert it into domestic market This means we'll see a temporary drop in prices, but not one that will last till the next harvest of onions arrives. Partha points out that all these attempts to control prices comes due to the fact that onion prices are a politically sensitive issue. Like this year, it's sensitive because of the upcoming Bihar elections. Onion is a crop which is politically sensitive, and the government keeps a very close eye on the prices of onion. You have the income tax, you have the police, the intelligence, everyone looking at the onion prices at last. You know, two years back when prices were high, the income tax officials went to look into the onion go downs of some of the traders to see if they are hoarding onions. And I don't know if it is the work of the income tax department to do so, but they had done it. But there was not much difference in prices. and though the government has announced a scheme to control the supply and prices of staples like onion potato and tomato not enough has been done in the case of onion says partha partha says that though this government has a scheme to control the supply and prices of staples like onion potato and tomato not enough has been done in the case of onions maybe in the next two or three years time we will have a parallel chain value chain in which such shocks or such price shocks can be absorbed by the consumer and while farmers continue to get good money Before we get to the next segment I just wanted your quick attention one of the big reasons people say that they like this show is because it helps them understand the news better it provides them with the context they need to see the bigger picture and there's perhaps no other place that does this better than the Indian Express's explained section we on three things refer to the section regularly and it helps us make this show if you're a regular reader of the newspaper you know how useful the explained section can be especially when you're looking for in-depth analysis by the right experts you can log into indianexpress.com/explained and access their coverage 24/7 explained by the indian express when news that matters is explained by experts who know the subject now back to the show india has been recording over 1000 deaths every day and over 80000 cases of covid-19 for weeks now As the number of cases and deaths rise across the country, one thing that's become clear is the spread of the virus beyond the urban centers in states. The spread of the virus that was initially restricted to state capitals and major cities has since spread to other districts that are often inadequately prepared to deal with the spread of the virus. Earlier this week, the Indian Express's Devraj Devan Tripura spoke of how critical COVID-19 patients from across eight districts of the northeastern state were traveling to the capital Agartala for treatment. other less developed districts across states have also seen similar cases with those who need critical care often struggle to get it take for instance the case of gujarat indabad was the epicenter of covid-19 cases in the state followed by industrial hub surat but there's been a gradual rise of cases across the state and with it has come one big issue a shortage of doctors in centers outside the biggest cities sohini ghosh who has been reporting on gujarat's handling of covid-19 for the indian express says there's been a gradual rise of cases as the state emerged from lockdown but there are other factors as well a doctor based in baroda he mentioned this aspect as well that in august we had the festivals of janmashtami and rakshabandhan this was around first or second week of august and by the third week you could tangibly see that there was a surge in cases now both these festivals are pretty big in the southern part of gujarat his point was that even if you have restricted religious gatherings or public gatherings people would gather at their houses so there would be tons of relatives coming in and of course that becomes a major source of infection and spread there was also this phase where initially migrants went back to surat once the diamond industries and the textile industries opened up but then the cases uh, rose in surat this happened by june and throughout july and even as of august so then again they started coming back there was the reverse migration again happening 
within Gujarat. So some districts such as Amreli, Surendra Nagar, they reported initially a migration from these districts and again a reverse migration, a second wave of reverse migration. And now we are again seeing a rise in cases in districts which had supposedly passed over the peak of the infection surge. One of the biggest challenges districts are facing is a shortage of adequately qualified medical professionals. So, for example, if you ask the officials at these districts, they'll mention that they have enough beds, they have enough ventilators. But when you ask them about manpower, it boils down to two doctors manning ventilators throughout the day. You can't just have two doctors 24 hours throughout the week. So he says that to overcome this, there was an initiative to rope in private doctors affiliated with the Indian Medical Association. Well, that worked in some districts, it didn't in many. But in some districts, there was quite a resistance from the association doctors. Now, the IMA folks, their version of the story is uh, we were not being respected. Our opinions, our medical opinions were not being respected. There was a atmosphere of threat. We were continuously being told by the collector that if we don't participate in treating COVID patients, our licenses would be cancelled. So there, uh, there was a stalemate in the discussion, in a way. So you had the IMA professionals being on the defensive. Plus the smaller districts have a very minimal presence of the IMA doctors. In addition to not having enough doctors, districts in the state were asked to send doctors from their medical colleges to help in hotspots like Ahmedabad. So it would be a 14 days ka duty. Then they would go back to their parent district, go in for quarantine and then again be deputed back. So this continued even after Ahmedabad's cases came under control. Now, uh, by July, end August, and even as of September, you're seeing rises in other districts, even, for example, in Jamnagar, which doesn't seem to be much of a focus point even for the state administration. The smaller districts especially, they found this problematic because they themselves were in need of doctors. So in some cases, such as Bharuch, they did make a representation to the state authorities saying that we don't want to send our doctors on deputation to other districts. Plus, we ourselves also need more doctors. But this was not paid heed to according to the Bharuch district administration. Soini says that while some hospitals were able to prevent their doctors from going on deputations, others weren't able to and as a result had a shortage of manpower when their caseload began rising. But why is there such a shortage of doctors in these districts? Firstly, there are a lot of sanctioned government doctors' posts which were never filled. They were always left vacant due to either, uh, say, unsound policies that did not really incentivize doctors to approach government hospitals or for some other reasons. Now, what the state tried initially was to deputize retired doctors or medical college professors as part of COVID duty. So they had brought out an advertisement. They did uh, try to get the message across, but there were no applications. Again, because the major concern here remains from the doctor's side is number one, security and safety. So these aspects, doctors across the board, be it in government hospitals or private hospitals, they do agree to this fact that this is often overlooked by the government. You can't be asking them to devote their life. You're literally asking them to put their life on the line without any insurance or assurance there. One concern that many private doctors who were asked to fill in had was that many of them were getting infected but wouldn't benefit from the state's compensation policy if something happened to them. Manpower is something that you have to invest in for years. That's something that Gujarat did not do very well. So now 
you can't be filling up hundreds of posts not only at your government hospitals and government colleges but also across your primary healthcare centers chcs so many of them are understaffed and that is bound to put a pressure especially now which is what we are seeing here plus with some places like bharuch they don't really have an explanation they try to hire people locally because all local district administrations were given the power that you can issue advertisement you can recruit people but there was not really any response they did mention that they put out an ad thrice in two months or so but there was hardly any response so there's a lack of participation from doctors because there is no assurance that you are giving that they'll be taken care of in case something happens and there's also a cumulative cascading effect that we are seeing now because everything is going here by of years of neglect that happened in the healthcare system where you did not fill up your vacant positions hundreds of vacant positions for years so what's the situation in the state presently so he says that multiple districts are now seeing a surge in cases but all these places their local administration while they suggest that deaths are numbering in 20s each day the state administration gives out approximately a constant number of either two deaths or three deaths or maximum four deaths so there is a data discrepancy there so we can't really assess in terms of mortality what is the situation in the state unless we have the complete data secondly they have discharged some 96000 over 96000 patients right now but we don't know how they are actually defining discharge even 6 months into this outbreak in the state because we have seen cases where dead people were still counted under discharged category so that was there and another concern is the kind of testing that's being done most states are relying on the antigen test to ramp up testing but that test is accurate only 60% of the time which is much lower than the accuracy of the rt pcr test or reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction test in delhi the high court asked the state government on wednesday to ramp up rt pcr testing in gujarat however sohini says that the number of rt pcr tests remains low which means it's difficult to assess the spread of the disease while the state is currently focusing quite a lot on testing with the cm himself putting out promos and ads and there are continuous ic material being put out by your local administration as well as the state administration i think this focus on testing needs to be balanced with rt pcr testing which is not really happening you can't have 10% or even fewer rt pcr tests done for some 80000 75000 samples that you take each day because that doesn't even match in terms of proportion with the icmr guideline that says that if a symptomatic person tests negative on the antigen tests you have to get them rt pcr tested so even by that guideline 10% doesn't really satisfy that condition of icmr ka testing guidelines a special court in lucknow said it will deliver its judgment on the 30th of september in the case filed over the demolition of the babri masjid in ayodhya in 1992 The court directed all 32 accused to remain present in the court on the day of the judgment. The list of the accused include former Deputy Prime Minister L K Advani, former Union Ministers Murli Manohar Joshi and Uma Bharati, former Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Kalyan Singh, Vinay Kattiar and Sadhvi Rithambara. Most of the accused have said that there is no evidence against them and they were falsely implicated in the case due to political vendetta. The mosque was demolished on the 6th of December 1992 by a mob of Kar Sevaks since the mosque was believed to have been built over the birthplace of Lord Ram. In 2019 the Supreme Court held that the demolition of the mosque was a violation of the rule of law but allotted the disputed plot for the construction of a Ram temple. The foundation of that temple was laid by Prime Minister Narendra Modi earlier this year. 
as per the directions of the Supreme Court, an alternate five-acre site has been allotted for the building of a mosque. The Indo-Islamic Cultural Foundation, which is developing the alternate mosque, said that the construction of the shrine and other public utilities like a hospital would begin by the end of November. You were listening to The Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Arun George. And as always, was edited and mixed by our producer, Joshua Thomas. Before we go, here's another reminder to check out Indian Express's Explained page. You can log on to indianexpress.com forward slash explained and find in-depth analysis by the right experts. It has everything you need to know to understand the news better and see the bigger picture. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.